Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 121. I'm your host, Barney Smith of StoryComic.com, and we're excited to have with us the award-winning author, S. Lee Manning. How's it going? Going great. Great. Yeah, you just got, you. I just saw, you know, look, looking at your website, send everybody interested, go to SLeeManning.com, and on there you have, what's up? Uh, pretty exciting you have like your your author book but you also have on here your award that you won for your first book my first book yeah there we go here we go the the so there was a couple that you won then right well i was a finalist for killer nashville which is actually the probably the most prestigious and um and then i was a finalist for a couple other another one and then i won a different one and then i had a lot of really good reviews right yeah you got some kirkus reviews and stuff like that i saw that uh and so you're you're here now you're in vermont uh your career was a, as a lawyer nana you wrote uh the you wrote uh trojan horse you wrote your it was a a koila petrov thriller it's gonna oh, be yeah. it's a trilogy right is it well, it's it's an ongoing series. Next, okay. Week. So I'm on the third now. Okay. And I remember you saying in a previous interview when you first started writing the uh, Trojan Horse, it ended up being what 800 pages at first, and then my first draft, <laughs> 850 pages. Jeez, Louise. And and so you, but your final book, the Trojan Horse, is about I think 280 or so pages. Well, that's about a little over 300. Okay. And then Nerve Attack just came out last month. Right. And, and that's about 350, I think. Okay. I got 370 according to Amazon. Well, so. Yeah, I was going to say, well, I don't remember exactly. It's <laughs> I'm an English major. I don't do numbers. <laughs> so so talk to us a bit about, for, for those that are interested, because uh, this is kind of goes across all, uh, all levels of international intrigue and uh, thriller. And as you said, you got great reviews on it. Uh, people loved your, for uh, the, the, your inaugural book here, just kind of give uh, folks who are kind of interested in wanting to learn more about this series. What would be the kind of the, uh, the back of the book synopsis of it? Well, I, um, you want to start with Trojan horse? Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's Trojan yeah. horse. Okay. So, um, my main character is uh, named Kolya Petrov, and he is a Russian Jewish immigrant to the United States who works for an American intelligence agency. And he is set up by his own agency to be kidnapped and tortured in a devious plot to stop a Romanian neo fascist. That's that's the elevator pitch. That's the elevator pitch. That's the elevator pitch. What I'm going to tell you is beyond the elevator pitch, what people really love about this, beyond the fact that they can't put it down and <laughs> it seems to disturb their sleep patterns and they get very annoyed at me. But what they love are the characters that I, I am very big on um, on characterization and, and having likable characters who you can empathize with. And did you so when it comes down for the for for those that are uh, interested in how you came up with it? Did you did you come up with the story idea first, or did you have a character that you kind of you, you thought of first? It's like, okay, what can I do with this character? How did that process happen? Well, I think probably. I mean, to be honest, uh, if you want me to tell you the story of riding Trojan horse, it was so long ago. I'm not sure I remember. I came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, that 850 pages was written in about 2004. Right. Um, and then I cut it in half, and then I cut it some more, and then I sent the first pa 50 pages out to uh, Mystery Writers of America at that point in New York had a contest for unwritten, unpublished authors. Mm. And... Um, whoever had the, they uh, won the contest would be read by an agent. And I won. So oh, wow. I was read by an agent. The first, she read the first 50 pages. 
She asked to read the rest of the book. Then she signed me and I thought, oh, goody, I'm in. And then she couldn't sell it. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, what, so what was some of the response? Was it because that was at that point, it was still like the 850 pages? No, it was like 420. It was by then it was like 425 pages, but right. it was the problem was more. I had, you know, I got uh, the great story, uh, great characters. I'm up to my ass in spy thrillers. Right. And, and did you have, so, so with that, you know, with that said, I remember you also said in uh, a previous interview that, you know, you're, uh, the feedback you first got from it as you sent it out. And you know, as I think you said, lovingly, I made my friends read it. Um, they, <laughs> they said, uh, one of them says, yeah, after the first 300 pages, I couldn't put the book down. And then your response was, well, I guess I got to fix the f first 300 pages. Yeah. A lot of that went out. <laughs> so was that like a self editing piece or is that someone that you got feedback saying, you got to take this out or you got to take that out? How was, how, how, how did that happen? Well, when you have your friends um, read your books, you have to be very careful what kind of questions you ask them because your friends are not going to, are going to lie to you. They're going to tell you they like your book and they don't. Um, but what you want to say is, you know, what did you find most compelling? What, what bored you? Um, was there some part that, that you, you know, took you a long time to read and you sort of get that together and then you say, okay, um, the first 300 pages dragged and probably um, because I was a, a beginning novelist, I put in way too much backstory, way too much, see, too many scenes that didn't have enough with, to do with the plot, but they were, they were sort of character development and um, I found them incredibly interesting myself, but I could see where a reader would, would kind of drag a little, so. Right. I said time to cut. And so how hard was that decision to make that you you kind of had to do that? Did it were you able to say what well, maybe I can use this later because I kind of Yeah, well, so I, I've still got this. the first draft somewhere. <laughs> 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 I thought so yeah, I, I um it's hard. It's always hard. I use I see, even now when I um write a new book uh, if i'm cutting scenes i have like a document that says cut scenes and i will save them and then uh, maybe i can you know think maybe i'll use them another time and usually i don't <laughs> usually you don't. Uh, so so nerve attack so that was the your second book was this part of the chop in half or was no. this completely completely, completely different. new okay. completely different All right. completely different so at the end of Trojan horse, uh, Kolya, who has uh, suffered uh, um, tremendously through the book and is, but manages to survive, is um, fairly pissed off with his agency and quits. So I had to figure out for Nerve Attack how I'm going to get him back and how I'm going, what what I'm going to do to have a uh, credible threat that he could he would have to address. And so I started to think, what would be something that <clears throat> he could address and no one else could address? Mm. So I started thinking about, well, what if his best friend, as a, his childhood best friend, who he put in prison, and you find that out in the previous book, is, has a clue to something that is very dangerous and he won't deal with anyone but call you? And I thought... Okay, that, that's a start. Then the other thing that re I really wanted to put into this book is, um, have you ever been to BB Plains? No. Oh, it's this cool little town right over the border from Derby Line. Okay. Um, and on one side of the street, it's Vermont, and the other side of the street, it's Quebec. So you drive down that street, and if you turn in a, a driveway, on the right side, so on the right side. If you're f coming from the Canada side, the uh, U.S. Border Patrol will be there in <laughs> <laughs> no time. And if you do uh, the other, you know, go in the driveway on Canadian side, the Canadian Border Patrol uh, will come pay you a visit if you happen to be have come from America. Oh wow! Okay, so it's a really cool. And I thought, okay, this this is I've got to put this into a story. <laughs> <laughs> So everything comes from that. 
Right. Do you have so when it comes down to well, especially when you're having you 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 have a you know a a pretty a, a pretty well established protagonist uh, with uh, with uh, with Kolya. What do you struggle in trying to find? Because one of the one of the things that uh, people talk about is like in order to create that antagonist, you have to create that level of you have to make the antagonist seem you know more powerful than your protagonist to create that drama piece do you feel as though as you know as you know as your yes you say your series is continuing that you're trying to as you mentioned earlier with the with the uh, with the backstory trying to always one up it a bit to make sure that there is a there is that sense of tension and danger for your characters well i always have to i mean i don't find the um the question of making the villain a more powerful than Kolya, the, the real problem. What mm -hmm. I, I find the, the really the big challenge for thrillers or mysteries in general is to have get your protagonist into trouble and not have them appear like an idiot. <laughs> I, I mean, how many, I, mean, I can't tell you how many times I've started reading a book and someone could do so. I said, why are you doing this? What are you, stupid? <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, I can't, uh, you have to have a, um, you have to get your, your protagonist into hot water because right. you have to put them in danger, but you have to do it in a way that they don't appear to be stupid. Right. And that I find is the biggest challenge. Um, and so it, it means having that sometime and you do have to have a fairly clever antagonist, but you have to have plausible reasons why your protagonist would take a risk. Mm. And, and do you, so, you know, so with that said, do you have to sometimes when you write thrillers in the sense, like, do you have to kind of write backwards, like create the, the solution to the problem then create the problem in order to have your protagonist discover the problem because you already know what the solution is in advance does that make sense yeah I, it makes sense but i don't do that oh no <laughs> so you so, so you you like writing yourself into a situation for you to like also try to figure it out then too well, i actually i mean I have, I do, my, my method basically is I will basically do like a paragraph or two what the book is about. And then I, I'll do, I, I tend to do this longhand because I can carry it around and go do it somewhere besides at my computer. And then um, I do the paragraph summary of, of what I think the book's going to be about. And then I'll do a, you know, like maybe hand write 10 pages scene by scene what I think should happen. And then I start writing it and it all goes out the window. <laughs> and do you actually, do you have then like, it's just from the, from the writing, the, the, the author perspective, do you, as you say, you kind of have a notebook with you. Do you have a, like a, a book of ideas? Like, all right, I'm going to try to, do you try to like fit in really good ideas you have into the story? Or do you write as you're telling us like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to, um, let me go through my book of ideas, my books of ideas here. How does that work for you? Um, I usually have a pretty firm idea <laughs> of what I'm trying to do in the book when even, even though, you know, the scenes will sometimes divert, but I know what I'm trying to do and the ideas I'm trying to get across. Um, but exactly how I'm going to do that, I don't know. I can't, I think part of the fun for me is, is hey, uh, this kind of works. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you ever in a position there where, like, who's in charge? Are are you in charge as, as the author, or is Koyla in charge? Does he uh, does do you get surprised by what your character does, or are you in control the whole time? Um. There are times when I, I start to write a scene and I can, it's, it's more, it's not that he does something that, that it's more like I can feel him like, like hitting me in the back of my head and say, stop that woman. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. And I say, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
So give us a little bit of a background uh, of where you kind of start. Cause you, you were having just, uh, you were doing really well. Like you're, you're a lawyer. You got one of the things that your, your point of pride is having to remove the death penalty in, in, in Jersey, correct? Back in right. 2007. I was chair of, uh, chair of the uh, New Jerseyans for alternatives to the death penalty. And we helped uh, abolish the death penalty in New Jersey. In fact, I, wrote the first draft of the legislation mm. in because you have a you had a successful career uh wh what was the turning point for you to say uh i think i'm going to start writing now how was well, that? you have it backwards actually oh, okay oh you were a writer I'm, first i was then. a writer first i okay. i right. always i wanted to be a writer from the age of five years old. And right. when I was five, I read this book where the dog died. And, and I said, no one should ever have a dog die in a book. And so I said, I'm going to be a writer and no one's going to, no dogs are going to die. <laughs> but I always, I loved books. I loved reading. That's how I spent all my time as a kid. And I started writing and I wrote one essay contest and all, I always told people, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to be a writer. Um, when I was, I went to uh, University of Cincinnati in English. I went to University of Chicago, got a master's in English. <clears throat> went back to Cincinnati, took some jobs writing newsletters, won a short story contest. Um, and uh, then I said, okay, I'm going to New York to be a writer. And I was pretty young. I was, you know, in my early 20s. And I got to New York uh, and I, I got a job on something called Law Enforcement Communications, where I was an editor and uh, writer and I wrote, you know, various articles. And, um, but I was living in an apartment with five other people. I was dead broke all the time. And I was, it was, um, it was before I met my husband. And I said, you know, and I was sitting there thinking, I'm going to be 45 years old. I'm going to be single, dead broke, uh, living with five people, and I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what other what other job would my skills, which happen to be verbal and um, and writing, um, what what else could I do that would might make me a little bit more money? Mm -hmm. And I said, ah, law school. Okay. So that's when I went into law. Okay. And I well, also, I mean, you know, there's part of me that also, also liked the idea that I would have a certain amount of power to right some wrongs. <laughs> and, and so, so, you know, with, with that done, then you, you made a, did it seem like an, a, an organic decision to go back into writing or was there a, a definitive moment where you said, you know what, I think it's, it's time for me to um, start writing my books again. Well, I wrote my, the first book I ever wrote was actually after my second child was born. I was home on maternity leave and um, I decided to write a book. Now it's a terrible book. It's never seen the light of day. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen that before, yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I think I always assumed at some point I would go back. It's just, you know, unfortunately being a, a lawyer is such a time, time consuming um, occupation that I just didn't have the ability to do it. I, there are some people who are lawyers and write. I, I can't do that, couldn't do that. But once, um, but then there was, um, I think in, when I wrote uh, Trojan Horse, the first draft, I was working part time. So I wrote at the same time. Yeah. And, and what were some of the things that, I guess, how did your writing change pre-lawyer uh, career and post-lawyer career? Was there anything that you were able to, um, that you learned in that career that you were able to grab a hold of and, and utilize in your writing that you've seen that it had your writing improve? Well, I would say my research abilities are much better. <laughs> my ability to bullshit. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't know if you can put that in your pocket. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it's more of a maturity and more, a, you know, getting to know uh, people. I'm not sure. Um, 
I mean, uh, I'm not sure I could have written a male protagonist with as much depth um, as a young woman, unmarried young woman. I've been married to the same man now for almost 40 years. And there's there's certain aspects of him that come through, come out in Kolya. Yeah. And um, um, I think that helped, I think just maturing and, and uh, life experience makes the bigger difference. Right. And you said, I remember you, uh, you said in an, you said before too is that there was a uh, you've not you're not a big fan like you're like you're saying in a in another interview that you you don't look at it's hard for you to like watch you know, like you know violent movies or any of that hard and but there's some scenes in, in in Trojan Horse that are like that and you said uh, so what made you what was the draw for you to write like international espionage thrillers like, well. Um, I'll go through your two things. That, um, first, the draw on uh, international thrillers. I'm always fascinated by people who are... Tr um, I'm fascinated by the world. I'm fascinated by people who interact with the world, who um, have ideals and are trying to follow their ideals. Mm. And I think that most people who go into intelligence service, whether you know it works out or not, are actually... An, have some sort of ideals they think they're they're following and it can sometimes sometimes it can be very bad <laughs> but it's it also you know there's also um i like the idea of pursuing something bigger than yourself mm. and and i also found it interesting the the whole intel with intelligence work there's a lot of more gray area than there is black and white, you know, are, you know, are we really doing good things and protecting what we're doing to protect the security of the United States? Are we doing bad things? I mean, I raised some of those issues. Um, now, of course, in my book, we are doing a good thing because the guy is an international terrorist who's going to do uh, bad things to uh, a lot of innocent people around the world. But, you know, there's always that question. Um, of morality and and comparative morality and i find that i find people having to to grapple with that hmm. interesting so and in terms of i'm i'm this like hyper i was i've always been this hypersensitive person I, as a kid i i wrote just wrote this blog about how hyper scared i was of when i read uh, Dracula. I was so scared I couldn't sleep for like two nights. So I went down and uh, was begging my father to um, buy me a crucifix. And he said, uh, we're Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't know that Dracula cares. <laughs> so he said, I'll get you a Jewish thing to ward off. Actually, I'm wearing it now. It's okay. Called a mezuzah it has the uh, prayer. Uh, the, it's called the Shema. It's a prayer. Uh, Hero Israel, the Lord is God. The Lord is one. I'm not religious, but it reminds me of my dad. He got me that when I was 13, and I was so and I couldn't sleep because I was scared of Dracula. <laughs> um, I got better as I got older, but I was always if I watched, I could read violence more than I could watch it. If I watched it, I it, it affected me badly, and I'd stay up. You, but so I'm getting to the the thing. There are right. some very violent scenes in some of my in, especially in Trojan Horse. There are some explicit scenes of torture. Right. And I'm I actually chose to do that for a really deliberate reason. Um, I chose to do it because um, I actually am extremely against torture. Mm. And I think that it's something that people can rationalize if they don't have to see it. Mm -hmm. And I think see what see what you think is uh, you're doing. And I also I also wrote it because I don't think a lot of about what Trojan Horse is about is about the Colia's betrayal by the people he works for. And I don't think you understand or can feel the depth of betrayal if you don't actually see what what's done to him if it's mm. just sort of off 
off stage and you know and you someone says oh yeah he was tortured it's it's not the same it doesn't have the same impact right and and do you think as you mentioned it like it's for you it's easier to read it than it is to watch it is that something that uh, along the lines of passive entertainment versus active entertainment meaning that when you're reading the book the book doesn't read itself unless you're reading it where you know that that act uh, that the passive entertainment of a television program or something is still going to play i think if you're watching a, the the images that come in my mind um from reading are usually not as powerful as images i see on a screen mm -hmm. and i don't know if that's just me <clears throat> I still really prefer reading, but maybe because of that. Um, but I, I can't, what I see on a screen seems um, so much more real and it's really hard to get it out of my head. Right. Right. We had, so you, so you right now you have a uh, uh, nerve attack, which came out of, uh, uh, as you said, I think we said it was uh, September, 2021. So, right. Um, and so and what's what would be some of your advice and i remember you said you one piece of advice that you you, you said for for budding authors is write what you want to write what you love uh and write what you want to read because you're going to be proofreading it you're going to be reading it over and over again um so so you know with that said are you looking at are you uh you know, are you are you are you you're pretty good with this genre right now? Are you looking at other types of genres of literature that you're um, have on your to do list right now? Well, I'm probably I'm finishing the third um, Kolya book right now, which has to do with neo Nazis in Germany, um, and um, I'm considering taking doing a slightly different tact in the book after that. Um, I'm considering taking, Coley has got a, a girlfriend, his fiance actually, is a uh, fairly tough in her own right. And she's a, an attorney. And I was thinking of doing a more domestic thriller with, with her as the main protagonist. And he can play a, a you know, uh, be her the second fiddle or whatever. <laughs> right. So I, I was thinking of doing that. Um, there's some point I had, I had a couple ideas of books. I wanted to go explore where my dad spent um, World War II and right. do that just as a, but that's a, would be a nonfiction probably. And I, I'm going to have to wait until I feel comfortable going to Texas, which maybe never. <laughs> <laughs> and because you'd be doing some you'd be doing some active research right i wanted to go onto the scene and and see what it's like and right because that in that sense it's a little bit different than writing because uh i remember you you know, you know looking at your you're doing the the bram stoker version of like he you know looking at guidebooks and understanding where uh so do you it's so much easier now than in Bram Stoker's day because we've, got, <laughs> you know, we've got the internet. I mean, I, I can sit there and pull up. Okay, oh, what does this town look like? Right. And I can pull up pictures. Um, and I, I can actually, um, look up houses that are for sale and right. say, okay, I like this house. I'll put them in this house. Oh, because you can get pictures and kind of get an idea. Oh, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, look for real estate sites. That's a great thing for authors. You know, if, uh, <clears throat> when I was doing um, writing, Alex, choosing Alex's house in uh, Georgetown, um, I said I went on some real estate sites and then I, I picked out a, a house for her. I thought, very nice. I'd like to live there myself. <laughs> so, what would be your advice for authors who might have some, you know, issues of like, ADHD where you say you listen it's good to research but someone says yeah you know this is this is great at, you know great advice Esli but I got I just I just spent I, I just spent six hours you know researching something and I'm only going to be using like maybe five percent of what I just did because I just kept going down this rabbit hole of you know learning about you know Scandinavian wooden spoons or something like that what would be your advice to 
help try to parse out people's times in that sense. Well, I think you have to get to know yourself a little bit. First right. off, know when you write your best at writing and sometimes just, you know, sort of say, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to write now and put it away. And the other thing, um, I mean, some people write need to do that, though. Um, right. You need to sometimes go down the rabbit hole and then come back to it. And what I'm going to say right now is that what a beginning a writer needs to do is learn to forgive themselves. Mm. You know, um, it's not it's not a mathematical formula. You, you're, everyone writes in different ways. Everyone, you know, you, you do what you have to do, but, but we're, you know, we're trying to, we're creating a different world. I mean, it's, it's a very, actually, if you think it's really powerful, we're creating a universe. Right. Um, um, and sometimes you take little divergence and you're, while you're doing that. And, you need to sometimes say, okay, I've done it enough, but I think forgiving yourself, because I think what happens is more likely is you, you spend six hours down the rabbit hole and then people say, uh, then you'll say, oh God, I'm a failure. I'm not, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not writing. Wah. And then just say, okay, I did this. This is what I did today. And tomorrow I'm going to do something different. Mm. I'm going to write. What would be some pieces as well that you, that, uh, as you've been going through your writing journey and you, you know, as you said, you've been in some groups that kind of just some mentorships in a way, what were some of the, what were some of those pieces of advice that uh, other, other writers told you that you're like, that is gold. I'm going to write it on a sticky note and stick it right on my screen. Or do you have any of those pieces of advice that um, really a just really weird piece of advice though? <laughs> <laughs> like get a chart for names. Get a chart for names. Make a chart. Okay. I'm reading someone's book now, and I, I who, uh, um, and they must have 20 people who start whose name starts with C, and I, and I'm trying, <laughs> I'm sitting there saying, okay, I know, you know, which which guy is this? Is it, you know, is it this one? This one? You have to, you know, if you have a lot of characters, you really have to get a chart, write down. Um, and make sure you don't have too many people with the same similar names because your readers will go nuts. Oh, okay. That's a, that's a, that's a good piece of advice. And, and so was that something you kind of discovered on your own or is that something? No, that no. Someone, um, uh, who I was uh, friends with and I'm not no longer. And I don't want to say much <laughs> about that was, uh, giving me that advice. And I, I sat down and I did a chart, you know, write down all the names, the other thing is try to simpl simplify. Um, don't have too many characters. You know, try mm. to. I mean, I, I write very complex books, and I tend to have a lot of characters, so um, I'm at fault. But if a character doesn't need a name, just describe. You know, the old man who uh, thinks he. You know, the old man who was in the uh, SS he doesn't have to have a name necessarily. Right. Did you have to like another part of it too? Is like when you're talking about that chart, having like a brief description or like a personality personality stereotype or anything like that as well. Or well, it's also this is another thing that is good to have is, and you can do it longhand. I like longhand, but um, do background studies of your your main at least your your characters who play active roles. Mm. Who are they? Where do they come from? And and keep it so that, you know, if you do a series, five books down the road, you don't have to go back and read all the books to figure out, okay, okay, where did they go to college? <laughs> you know, um, say, you know, do do a background study of a couple pages, you know, their who their parents are, who the what they went to, they studied, what they studied, uh, what their hobbies are, their best friends, you know, all the stuff that you would think of for somebody you're describing um, if you describe and then you have it at hand and you don't have to keep searching for it. Hmm. Now, as you say, your, your books take place in, you know, you know, uh, the real world, I guess to, to put it mildly, is there, is there certain things that you feel that as a, as a drawback or a benefit as compared to somebody who is writing a, like a science fiction book or, 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 or fantasy novel. Do you feel the benefits? What are some of the benefits of having your books take place in, 
you know, um, in, in, in recognizable situations. Well, I, I just want to make one correction. Right. It's sort of real world, but right. it's an alternative real world because um, I have a make-believe president and I have a make-believe uh, senators because I didn't want to deal with real political figures, right. especially since I wrote Trojan I, the last draft of Trojan Horse was when Trump was in office. Right. Um, Although there is there is one real political uh, figure who is mentioned in one of my books, which is when Coley and Dimitri land in Burlington. Dimitri says, uh, "Do you think we'll see Bernie Sanders?" <laughs> but um, in terms of your question about writing real world versus fantasy or science fiction, it's you can um, you don't have to focus as much on description, on create world creation. Mm. If that's what you really want to do, then, then that's what you should do. But I'm more interested in character, in plot development and character development. And I'm not as interested. I mean, I have to like, when I'm writing, I have to go say, okay, I have to describe where they are. Okay, damn it. <laughs> no, um, you have to do, put in description. I'm not a big on, on descriptions. And I, I put it in because I have to. Right. But um, I'm the heart for me is sort of the emotional impact, um, the characters relationships and then how that moves the plot. Right. And I think for it's either science fiction or um, fantasy, you do have to do a lot of world building. And that's that's I like, enjoy reading it. I mean, I, I but it's not um, something I, I want to do. Right. And, and so, you know, you know, with that said, because one of the benefits of also having it take place in a recognizable world that you're able to not have to throw in a lot of adjectives, you say, you know, that, you know, you land the plane or like, these are the kind of things where you don't have to overly explain systems and right. sciences and stuff. Right. Yeah. You don't have to have like, um, um have explain exactly what what it is that they're they're flying or what it is they're landing on or um uh you know having a tree that talks come up to you or something like that <laughs> i was just listening i was just listening to lord of the rings on on audiobook last night so <laughs> so you didn't have to invent any new languages or any of that other no, no languages no poetry <laughs> <laughs> I so, like poetry too, but it's not in my books. <laughs> Do you also, as we went online, you've also been doing some uh, over the past year. Well, you know, pre-COVID, you were uh, uh, diving into doing some stand-up. Do you put in? Do you find yourself wanting to add some, you know, some, some humor to the to the story as people are reading it, and, and is that important? <laughs> Well, I think um, I always liked <clears throat> the uh, sort of tradition of having witty dialogue in mm -hmm. even serious uh, situations. And I like to think Coley is kind of a witty guy and he gets himself in trouble <laughs> sometimes for it. Um, there's some point where he's, um, I'll give you an example. He uh, isn't allowed, he, even though he's quit the intelligence world, he's not allowed to tell anyone that he used to be an intelligence operative. Mm -hmm. So there's some point where he has, he, um, he, there's some house invaders and he kills them. And it's a long story, but um, the police show up and he can't tell them, you know, he says, well, I used to work for the IRS. And they say, well, um, how do you get so good at killing people when you work for the IRS? He says, YouTube. YouTube. <laughs> so I always try to put, I do put a little bit of um, wit, I think, mm. into into my dialogue. Um, but I, I, they're basically serious situations. I mean, I, I don't write comic novels. Right, right. And do you have, and how much, because we mentioned before about the research piece, because there's a lot in... There's a lot in here that have to do with like not only international aspects, but there's like science and technology aspects of the stuff. Um, how much research did you have to do to make it believable to 
the readers that the characters know what they're talking about. Well, a lot of the, <clears throat> in the first book, um, which was written, <laughs> I had to change the technology so many times, but I'll, I have to tell you that, because uh, I rewrote that I had a contract for it in 2015 and then that fell through. And then I had um, my, my contract with my current publisher and it came out you know, last year. Um, I had to rewrite that and I kept checking it with, and I, I didn't do a tremendous, I have to admit, I, I'm, I am not, my books are not highly technological. I do not explain how the, a lot of it works. I do not talk about, I just say there's a virus. I don't say how you create the virus I, or how it gets on. Right. I don't really care. <laughs> um, in terms of the, uh, the second the uh, most technological thing in the second book, I guess, is the Novichok poison. And I, I happen to have one of the uh, friend who was one of the foremost toxicologists in the country, and she's also an author. And um, we chatted about it about it a little bit, so that helped. So, you we we have, uh, you, as I said, we have people that listen that are budding authors or people that are looking at that are trying to get their books published as well. And they'll say, Hey, you know, I, I got a book, I got it edited. I think it's good. How did you find a publisher or should I go, could I, should I just try to self publish this? What would be your advice? Well, it depends on what you want to do. I right. mean, um, I, I'm in favor of trying to do the traditional route at least, it's so hard out there right now right. to sell a book. It's so hard if you're in, you know, for people who are self-published. I mean, there was a little window of time when people who were self-published were doing could do pretty well, but there's so many self-published books now to get right. um, above the noise. If you've got a really good book and you think you can get one of the big five, um, give it a shot. Mm. You know, if 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 you, but. I'm going to say get some beta readers, get other people to, who who are in going to be honest about what your flaw, the flaws are and what the uh, what works well, what doesn't work well. Um, and and if it's you've got the absolute best book you can you you can put out and then give it a shot. I mean, because honestly, I hate to say it, uh, being with one of the five, big five is gives you a, a certain level of, of power that you don't have being either even either with a small publisher, which which I am, or with a independently published. Um, and if it doesn't work, then then consider what else you want to where you want to go with it. Right. Um, would you recommend like any, is there any uh, groups or, or connections that you would uh, recommend people who are working on a book that they could connect with as, as well? Well, I only know the mystery and thriller field and I okay. really highly recommend Sisters in Crime, New England and the Mystery Writers of America and Thriller Writers of America. They're all organizations that are for, they're for mystery, thriller, writers and and they're great people and they're very helpful right. and a lot of them i'm actually in a uh critique group through uh thriller writers of america and and for somebody that as you bring up like that specific genre is is it important for an author to read other genres to to uh help increase their if they want to stick to a genre or just read all the books you can find in that specific genre. Well, I, I think it's my advice would be read the best books you can in mm. genres that you like. Right. Um, I mean, I, I mainly read thrillers and mysteries, but I, I like other things. So I read them too. And, but read good books, the best books you can find, because you know, a lot of the, what you learn about style and craft comes from, from the books you read. Right. Yeah. And, and, and what were some of the, so what are some of the, uh, so talk to us a bit about your, your, your writing schedule. How do you sit down? Like as we we kind of like 
talked about it earlier. And I think you said that you, um, you get your office, you sit down and write, do you mark off your hours? Do you have it scheduled pretty tightly or is it more? For <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, uh, I tend to, um, write best in the, in the uh, morning. If I don't get distracted by something, I have ADHD too. Um, <laughs> so if I don't get distracted, the morning's my best time. But then I also get, <clears throat> along with being ADHD, sometimes I get, um, what you can do is get hyper-focused on something and then I can't put it down. And so I just will just keep writing it. And um, sometimes I, I can do 10 pages in a day if I go into hyper-focus mode. Wow. But I try to make myself write in the mornings after I've had my coffee and before, you know, I've, between coffee and lunch is my best writing time. Right. But I don't, it's not real structured. And so when it, when it came to, so with, with your books themselves, so I guess my, uh, another question that we usually get as well as um, cover design. Is this something that uh, is it in Circle Publications? Oh yeah, kind of took over, or did you have any any? Uh, oh no, they have a, they have an absolute fabulous cover designer, and okay. I mean I do have input. If I hated either one of those, I could have said nah, but I love them both. Okay, and and so they did they did all that stuff, and so if yeah. you're able to find you're able to find a publisher, did, they must then do some developmental editing and some line editing as well too right well they do some they do some but usually it's it's um it's important to have your book as good as you possibly can before okay. i get it into them right and i usually i have i i usually have um two very good editors read it before i send it in hmm. There's my daughter who has a screenwriting degree in, uh, and lives in LA. And then my husband who has a, a PhD in English from Columbia. <laughs> so that's, that's really helpful to actually have two people in the family that will, and being your, and being like your, your, your spouse and your, and your child, they probably are not, they probably don't wear kid gloves very much for you then too. Huh? Well, my daughter is, <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. My husband's, you know, he he sort of wants to stay on speaking terms to me. <laughs> but what I I did do with, for example, what I did with uh, with uh, Nervatech, which was very helpful. He read it, and then I went down and I sat with him and I went through chat each chapter and I said, "Does this work? Does this not work? What works for with it?" And I pulled out of another like. 30, 40 pages because he says, you know, this doesn't do add anything. It just sort of slows it down for me. And I said, okay. So how big was, because Nervatech was about 370 pages. Now, was it bigger than that before? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I always, I overwrite and then I have to cut back. And so you're working on now the third, uh, is there a title for the third book? Or? It's called Bloody Soil. Bloody soil. Okay. All right. It's a play on blood and soil. Right. And, and that's going to, is that going to be coming out? You seem to be coming out with like a book a year. Are you trying to keep that trajectory going? I'm trying to come, this is planned to come out in November of 22 when actually my husband's first book is coming out. Wow. Okay. All right. All right. Excellent. So, yeah. It's, and and so and you and you were probably and you're going to be able to you you have you have listed on your website too about some appearances and stuff like that. So are we? Are you still being able to do appearances if people are interested in in checking out your book and seeing any of your, um, uh, seeing uh, any more of your interviews? Is there uh, updated lists that they can be able to find? Well, I I haven't. Um... I, I have a few, um, I've talked to a few other libraries around Vermont. I mean, the, Nervatech is very attractive in Vermont because a lot of it takes place in Vermont. Okay. But um, I don't have anything else de definitively set at this time. Uh, oh, I have a couple things on, on there that are in um, 
I, I think in the uh, see, um, but there's only about three more appearances I have in the next. Uh, that are set, but as soon as I have more things, I will update it. Hmm. This is exciting stuff. This is uh, so so. It's so amazing to just see uh, the success of what this the, the book and you, you kind of you, it seems as though you're hitting on, as you say, some geographic um, some geographic. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? I uh, see I'm not a writer, so I can't. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna timestamp this part so then I can edit this part aloud later. Um, <laughs> but it, it it seems exciting that you're able to you know touch on some uh, some excitement geographically speaking, but also as the genre itself, and and people really are eating up your eating up your your series which is must be heartening for you to keep writing the keep writing the storylines well i mean it's one of the things that uh, really helps keep me going is that people you know people telling me uh how much they love my characters and how much they love the series of course the, the, the flip side of that is that you're always you know writers are perpetually insecure and so um when i i'm sitting here writing the new one and saying, oh God, they're gonna hate this one. This one's not gonna be as good. And I'm hoping I, I'm hoping it will be, but uh, that's, you know, I did that with Nerve Attack too. I was saying, oh, it's not gonna be as good as Trojan Horse. They're all gonna be disappointed. <laughs> but they're not, no. Even they haven't been. I've actually had a lot of people say they like it even better. Great. And and you did have so you you have been going to some libraries it looks like I've been to some quite time. a few actually it's it's been a lot of fun I I love libraries right yeah well great this is fantastic Esley I appreciate you coming on and you got to come make sure I can put it on the calendar make sure you come back on when you talk about uh, um, blood bloody soil right bloody soil again it's uh as i said you know the nazi had a slogan of nazis had a slogan of blood and soil right so i decided to play off that okay perfect well thank you very much this has been uh this has been a, a genuine pleasure and we're able to you're able to throw out some great ideas and being able to give some pretty good advice and and I'm sure all of our international thriller fans are going to be excited to pick up the book now. So, no, thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Thank you. Not native to Vermont, though, right? You're or no, I'm not native to Vermont. Okay, I'm actually right. native to Cincinnati, Ohio. Via okay, and I got got here from Cincinnati, Ohio, to New York, to New Jersey, and then here. Okay, Cincinnati, Ohio. That's where they had that with that the famous uh, turkey drop and uh, yes, KRP, <laughs> famous turkey drop. <laughs>